In autumn 1979, To the Manor Born, the BBC's star vehicle for Penelope Keith, landed into our living rooms and was an immediate hit. I don't think any episode got under 20 to 22 million, which now is sort of unheard of. It was so amazingly successful. <laughs> Phenomenally successful. <laughs> Viewers took Audrey Forbes Hamilton to their hearts, sympathising with her reduced circumstances and delighting in her attempts to come to terms with the real world. The whole fabric of society is becoming irreparably unstitched. <laughs> For a nation recovering from the winter of discontent, To the Manor Born was a reminder of a bygone era. It had that delightful Englishness about it, which is both idiotic and fascinating. It was firmly entrenched in the class system. If somebody doesn't serve me in a minute, I'll help myself. <laughs> and took an affectionate view of countryside pursuits. But what gave it an edge over other comedies of the time was the will-they-won't-they they relationship between Audrey Forbes Hamilton and the nouveau riche Richard de Vere. And to us? It seemed to capture the imagination of the entire country. It was escapist romance with a big R. The part of Audrey Forbes Hamilton practically cast itself... Penelope Keith's comedy career began in 1957 as a straight woman to Dick Emery in The Army Game. And she was soon putting herself about in action-adventure series like The Avengers. I wasn't a young leading actress in the normal sense of the word in as much as I was fairly plain. I had to get that out of my system. Which was lovely, which made me, gave me a chance at a lot of different characters. Hello, Dependent. How are you? I'm home. Hi. Good evening. Hey, Bram. Um, Welcome on, Gelbstein. Yes. That's nice. In everything from the film Every Home Should Have One to Yorkshire TV's Kate, Penelope played it plain and tough. But then came her big breakthrough, Margot Ledbetter in The Good Life, directed by John Howard Davis. All four of us always enjoyed it. We always laughed, and that was very much John's way. As well as being a great professional, he knew exactly what he was doing. He was the most enchanting man. Future Good Life producer John Howard Davis played Oliver Twist in David Lean's film, but he achieved even greater fame by helping to bring Monty Python's Flying Circus, Steptoe and Son, and Fawlty Towers to the small screen. Making The Good Life, he saw Penelope Keith create a role from an extremely minor character. Penny's part in the initial Good Life was a voice-off and saying one line. What is it? What's going on? It's the goods. They're dancing in their goldfish pot. <laughs> but you could tell even from that the determined authority of it, that she was going to be a central and pivotal character. Uh, hello, Maria. Yes, and yuletide felicitations to you. <laughs> Listen, Maria, I'll be as brief as possible. Absolute chaos. Jerry has chicken pox. <laughs> she developed this character very well indeed. Come in. Oh, thank you. The walk, the fashions, the authority. Just well, I did check that order. I mean, do I look as though I drink milk stout? <laughs> we all thought that four series was enough. There were various overtures made to Paul and me to do a spin-off, and I said no quite firmly. I said, the reason these characters work is because they're juxtaposed. That's what makes them funny. What was that for? I shall miss you terribly. So shall I. Jerry. Yes, I know. <laughs> what happened after Good Luck is I promised each and every one of them a series of their own. Um, Dickie Briar's got ever decreasing circles. I persuaded Paul to do... Uh, yes, Minister, and Felicity Kendall got solo, and I couldn't find anything for Penny Keith. And desperately, for about 18 months, I looked around, couldn't find anything that was suitable. I wanted a kind of sexy Barbara Woodhouse part for her. Writer Peter Spence had learnt his trade on the radio as comedy sketch writer for Roy Hudd. When Roy moved to television, Peter followed and sold sketches to Marty Kane and Lenny Bennett's TV shows but he also had ideas about developing a character of his own. Word got out that the BBC was looking for a vehicle for Penelope Keys. So I just responded to this, and the thing started uh, really with her. I was writing a show for her. I had been to a dinner party, and I met 
uh, chap called Peter Spence, who said that he was a writer. An actor's ears always a writer. Your ears pop up immediately. And so he said he had a script. Could he send it to me? And I said, yes, of course. And he sent me a script for a pilot for radio for To the Manor Born. It was very different from the one we all got to know. When it came to coming up with a new character for her, I just had really had to think of what she had been up to that point, which is the Margot Ledbetter character. All I did, really, was flip the coin round and looked at it from the other and say, what if this person was as grand as Margot Ledbetter pretended to be? The uh, edge being that uh, she had lost her husband, she'd lost her money. I said to Peter how much I had enjoyed doing it, and I said, I think it would make rather good television. Uh, would you mind if I sent it to John Howard Davis, who by this time was head of light entertainment of the BBC television? And I listened to it and thought it was wonderful. Uh, and we decided to do it, so I stole it from the wireless, much to their chagrin and disappointment. No one had ever rung me up from television before, and here was I getting this call from the top man asking me to go in with a view to uh, uh, writing a sitcom for them. It came as a tremendous shock. And I remember being absolutely terrified in the, in the uh, first instance. It meant that I had to wear a suit and practice pretending I knew what I was doing. Peter Spence had also been writing sketches for the pilot of Not the Nine O'Clock News, which had been commissioned by John Howard Davis. I said, no, no, you don't want to do that. You really want to write sitcom because, A, there's more money in it, which was quite a good reason, and, B... Uh, if you write sketch comedy, nobody will ever know what you have written. I mean, it wasn't being demeaning of nine o'clock news, but uh, he's saying I didn't want to be a sketch writer. And, um, and I remember thinking at the time, yes, actually, that's exactly what I want to be doing because that's where my mates are and things. He agreed after a little bit of uh, persuasion. I said I'd break his legs otherwise. Of course, I had no idea then that uh, To the Man of Born was going to take off in the way it did. So I'm very grateful that I was forced to make that choice. After persuading the writer to come on board, John Howard Davis handed over the job of producing and directing to Gareth Gwenlin, his former assistant, who had worked on The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin and Butterflies, written by Carla Lane and starring Wendy Craig as Rhea. He works well with women, Gareth, uh, as well as men, uh, but he has that particular talent that enables women to shine. This is my latest unhappy experience. His experience with Wendy Craig made Gareth Gwenlin a perfect choice for working with a strong leading woman. It is an apple sponge. He also found himself having to nurture a writer new to television. It became sort of clear to both John Howard and myself in the early days of the scripts coming in that while they had a very while they were funny and while they were creating interesting characters the structure of the pieces showed a naivety which needed some other help to get to put together. They weren't very confident about me at the very beginning because I'd only worked in radio, I hadn't worked in television, although I'd done sketches for television up to that point. Peter Spence was unusual in that he, had a, a, he has an enormous amount of talent, but he wrote alone, and it's sometimes very difficult to write a situation comedy alone because you have no yardstick to go by. You don't know when you've written too much or too little and so on and so forth. That's why Christopher Bond was brought in in the first place, to help him as somebody to bounce off. They didn't actually write together, uh, but what they did was uh, enhance each other's work. There were things that we discovered from doing it on the radio which we knew were wrong, which had to be changed. Audrey Forbes Hamilton and her school friend Marjorie stayed as they were on the radio, but in the transfer to television, her Pekingese became a beagle called Bertie, supporting characters were added, and the new Lord of the Manor changed from the rich American Matthias Beauregard to dashing Czech-born millionaire Richard de Vere. All the changes were made, and the manor was now ready to open its doors to the public. One of the problems that all sitcoms have is a, a, a good first episode that grabs the audience. Do you know where I could find Mr Forbes, Hamilton? He'll be here at any moment now. Oh, good. I'd, I'd like a word. <laughs> so I doubt if you'll get much out of him. <laughs> here he comes now. <laughs> I suppose that's what I found a bit startling, first of all, when I read to the Manor Born, the fact that she was so happy. And no-one ever questioned that. Nobody looking, is there? No. Right. Here goes. Yippee! 
it was a marvellous way of starting, and I think it made people think, what can this be about? I can't pretend that Martin pegging out like that wasn't the most wonderful thing that's ever happened. Just think, the Grantly estate, all mine now, all I ever wanted, it's too good to be true. Oh, dear, have I shocked you? Well, I must say, I'm a little bit taken aback. I mean, I knew that you and Martin didn't always get on. Well, we do now. 